KOPN Columbia. We're with the second edition of Artificial Intelligence with Professor Scott Christensen, University of Missouri School of Business. Scott, thank you for coming back to yes. KOPN, informing us more about AI so that we, the public, can understand what's happening behind our computer screens. Yes, well, there's a lot going on. I think it's kind of a complex subject or a little bit daunting because we have a lot of ideas about what AI may be from watching movies and, and uh, maybe be reading science fiction or something like that. Uh, but when we uh, come down to it, there's really AI that's being used to optimize certain processes. And that's a certain type of AI called machine learning. And it's really good when you have something that needs to be optimized or you have pattern recognition. And certainly there's lots of great applications in this field. So, for example, uh, radiologists are starting to use that to better detect disease. Uh, pathologists are using that to better detect disease as well. So there's a lot of things where this is going to be tremendously helpful to humans. But then on the flip side, we have things like social media and some persuasive technology, we might call it, where it's basically being used to try and modify our behavior. And maybe that's not something that's as good for us. Yeah, well, you certainly gave us this wonderful overview during the first AI 101, and we're on to 102, but just to <laughs> recapitulate a little bit, you were talking about the advances in medical diagnostic research, but then you were also talking about having your data used in commercial, but also perhaps nefarious ways, uh, but then also facial recognition in public spaces. There's lots of security, obviously, with uh, airlines and, and uh, lots of things that motivate us to positively identify someone. But I think what becomes more disturbing is when is this used outside of that one purpose? So in Hong Kong, where we've been seeing these protests continue and continue, one of the things the protesters have been u doing is using either lasers to try to uh, distract or uh, disrupt the facial recognition cameras or even tearing down these uh, smart uh, light posts, which supposedly have cameras in them that can do facial recognition. So that's... Do we have these here? <clears throat> um, not that I'm aware of, no. Not on that type of scale. And there's been some uh, larger scale experiments in China with um, looking at facial recognition, developing a trust score uh, to have kind of a social trust as far as how good of a citizen you are. Um, we certainly have public cameras that can be used in public spaces. So, for example, in our parking garages here, the city of Columbia maintains those. But I'm not aware that they use any sort of facial recognition uh, technology in them. There's a, there is a data retention policy there's you know pretty transparent policies on those things when it comes to government agencies or public publicly run government but what there aren't those types of regulations we uh, when you start to look at things like Facebook or Google or these other companies that make a lot of their money off of predicting and modifying your behavior so I think that's where a lot of the concern is right now especially in the US is not so much about the use of this technology by government because I think that's still pretty transparent as far as uh, you know our local city government and things like that but when you start to get into uh, what is the uh, ability of private uh, companies to, to use this data, to sell that data, to sell the predictive analytics about what you might be uh, likely to buy, likely to vote for, all that kind Your of stuff. Your credit scores, et cetera. You talked a little bit about that. You said that bringing in a third party that the unsuspecting user does not recognize as somebody who their data, data is going Right. To. So if you have a uh, device like a uh, Amazon Alexa or a Nest camera or something like that in your house, well, um, there's a 
agreement that you had to click through at some point to agree when you signed up for the service. But you mean those long, those long sheets, things we scroll you know, five, to the end? Five yeah, pages in which it's yeah. so small print that yeah, if it was five pages, it would be pretty uh, short um, <laughs> compared to most of these. But um, a lot of those say, well, we may sell your data to third parties or share it, and you need to go see their agreements. And so this becomes a very complex chain to really figure out how is my data being used. Almost impossible for right. the Right. Editor. So um, yeah, I'll tell you what, I brought a book here. I brought several books here that your listeners I thought might be interested in. Um, we'll start with the heaviest one first. Okay. <laughs> this is called uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism, The Fight for a Human Future at the New Frontier of Power. Uh, and Sohana Zuboff, I think is the correct way to pronounce the uh, author's uh, name. And she is a uh, Harvard professor. And she also uh, wrote a couple of books before called In the Age of the Smart Machine and the Support Economy. And she spent about eight years researching this book. And um, this book really goes into uh, detail about how we got into this position where um, it's almost assumed that our data is this resource to be mined. And she kind of starts asking the question, well, who decided that? And who decides what is an appropriate use of data? Because it certainly doesn't seem like we're getting to decide in that anymore. So it's uh, fairly academic. I uh, have been getting my way through it about 20 pages at a time, but mm -hmm. it's very detailed and there's a lot to take in in this book. And uh, she's really pointing out that these companies are no longer, the tech companies, are no longer really making something that's going to empower us to do something, but are really providing a service so that they can collect more data. So when you get your Google Maps, and I... So it's no longer giving, but taking. Right. So you're getting a Google Maps, and I'm finding out how to get to Lakota, right, uh, this morning for my coffee. But it now knows, well, Scott goes to Lakota. Well, let's track how often he goes to Lakota. So this kind of, um, some people call it a data exhaust from... Uh, our lives and the patterns we leave behind uh, is no longer something that just kind of evaporates. It stays with us, right? So it stays and it's just used to build a better model of uh, Scott and we can then correlate that while well, people that go to Lakota tend to vote this way or tend to like this. Uh, we know this from other data and so maybe we can market to Scott in a certain way. So it's just one data point that's used among uh, thousands and thousands of data points about ourselves. And and that sounds almost acceptable. We trade the convenience for this, but yet we really don't know how it will be used eventually or now even. Right. So that's um, you talk with people and they will say that they really are interested in privacy, but we trade privacy for convenience all the time. And I just don't think that people understand the depth to which that data is being used, kept and correlated. So even if um, I didn't use Google Maps to get to Lakota, if I'm there at Lakota and use their nice free Wi-Fi and I do a Google search, it now knows, well, Scott is at Lakota and because uh, it's geolocated that IP address and it knows that's Lakota's IP address and um, it's able to then correlate that once again as another data point. Um, so there's a lot of things. So we get free search, we get free Gmail, we get free maps, but it's not really free. We're providing the raw materials that are used for these predictive engines and then Google's customers are not us. They are the companies they're selling ads to. So... I think that's kind of uh, interesting, and she goes into really uh, kind of a sociological background uh, in which I'm not uh, as familiar with, but about how human experience has been captured as the raw material for these companies. Uh, and so that's a, a pretty interesting uh, book. I think it's very relevant. It's kind of, uh, she kind of hit it lucky, if you will, as far as publishing timing, because uh, people are very concerned with this. And even we're seeing this in our politics, right? So Josh Hawley, our senator, has been going after big tech. And um, I think some of his initial efforts were a little bit flailing, but I think he's Clumsy. gotten um, better at that. In fact, he had an editorial in the Washington Post, I believe it was last week, where he talked about the main uh, innovation of tech companies in the last uh, eight years has been exploitation. So um, we're learning how to... Uh, 
exploit uh, workers and we're using ha- learning how to obfuscate or to hide the fact that this is going on. So uh, are, are Uber drivers even making m- minimum wage? Uh, there was a case last month with DoorDash, this uh, place where you can order food, right? So you order your $15 uh, sandwich or whatever. It's going to cost you $15 to have this delivered to your doorstep. That's awesome. Here comes Daria up to your uh, front door, and she's you know obviously hustling, doing a great job. You give her a $3 tip. <clears throat> Well, she was going to get paid only $5 to deliver that. But now DoorDash says, oh, that's great. We got $3 from Scott, so we only have to pay her two, and we'll let Scott pick up the other three to make up the difference. (laughs) Okay? And so there was quite a controversy when people figured out this is what was going on, because obviously if I'm giving you a tip through the app, I'm thinking that's going directly to you. And um, so that kind of obfuscation about uh, what is really going on um, with these workers. Workers. And one of the things that a lot of comp- a lot of people don't realize and a lot of my students don't realize is most of these companies don't make any money. Okay, Uber has never made a dime. Lyft has not made a dime. Bird has not made a dime. They are trying to capture these large market shares. Same with DoorDash. They're burning through billions of dollars in hopes that they will get to a point where they become the monopoly and uh, can then you know, make money eventually. This has happened with Facebook. Facebook lost money for years and years. Amazon lost money for years and years. Is this a new business model that has... Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't... The last yeah, it's decade. kind of a weird business model where you lose billions of dollars on your uh, you know, business you and, the, and, the, and the founder becomes a billionaire. I mean, how can I do that, right? So, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I'm capable of losing money just as much as the next guy. Um, not uh, all kidding aside, it's um, it's an interesting business model. It, whether it's sustainable or not is uh, unclear. So uh, when you look at something like Uber or Lyft, some people have called this like Roman tax, right? So the, uh, the Silicon Valley is our new Rome, and every time a transaction occurs, uh, there's a little tax that flows off to Rome or to, in this case, Silicon Valley. So when I pay you uh, as my Uber driver, uh, there's a percent that goes not to you or doesn't go to the local taxi company. It now goes to Uber. You know, it's going to be interesting to see. I'm not sure that Uber and Lyft are really even good business models in the long term because uh, they've come into areas and they've deregulated, you know, have broken the regulations in areas. And taxi companies were profitable probably only because of regulation. (laughs) And so now uh, we're seeing uh, worker pay going down. Uh, We're seeing uh, businesses having a harder time uh, competing. So are we just going to see a decimation in some of these industries the same way we saw a decimation in the news industry? Tie in the news industry. Tell us about that. Well, the news industry uh, for a long time had great profits, so 20 to 30 percent profit margins uh, consistently for a very large time. And they got uh, kind of, uh, I would say, a little bit complacent, didn't put much money into R&D, okay. research and de- development, you know, okay. new products. Um, and so when things like Craigslist came along and basically offered you a classifieds ads without having to uh, Uh, pay the newspaper company. They didn't really recognize the threat that it was. They didn't recognize the threat that providing um, their news online might offer. Uh, And they didn't recognize uh, how their content was being used by Google uh, News, by social media shared otherwise and how that was going to impact them. Uh, you're starting to see that turn around some. So the Washington Post with its uh, has had a very effective paywall Wall Street Journal uh, has been very good about developing uh, and is continuing to developing uh, excellent reporting uh, and being able to sell that reporting. But once again, we're starting to kind of see this consolidation. So here we have Gatehouse that bought the uh, Columbia Tribune, which was a state institution here in town. Of course, we have the Columbia Missourian, which is an excellent paper, but uh, Gatehouse seems to be not, not that good of a company uh, in a lot of ways, right? So uh, not only with the way it deals uh, with this kind of consolidation and we're going to drive all the costs out of it as fast as possible in order to increase their profit, but what are they leaving behind? You know, not much of a paper, I would say, compared to what the Tribune used to be. 
talking about artificial intelligence as it affects the public the public as we go forth in our unknowing world. Right, and there's lots of different ways uh, that this is going to affect us. And we talked about some of the good ones before, about the medical diagnosis pattern recognition. Uh, We talked uh, just briefly here about some of the uh, bad aspects of that with social media and how it might be uh, used to manipulate our behavior. But there's also this whole other area of how it is going to affect our work, right? So um, this is another book I would recommend. It's called AI Superpowers. China, Silicon Valley, and the New World Order by Cao Fu Li. And Cao Fu Li, I believe, worked for Google for many years in China. Uh, Yes, he was president of Google China. And he has very interesting kind of take on AI, the Chinese approach to AI, being able to put um, millions or billions of dollars into uh, the kind of daily work of AI, this automation optimization. So he talks about there being these AI superpowers, basically the U.S. and China, and what are the different models under which they're operating. So actually, China has developed it further than the United States. Well, in some or respects, in a different way? I would say that uh, they've developed it as far as being able to apply it, uh, machine learning, apply it in a huge range of areas. Okay, I would say the U.S. is still kind of the leader in specialized research in AI. So we still have very good researchers at our uh, institutions, including here at the University of Missouri. I think that's where we kind of specialize in in developments, but I think the Chinese are much better at rapid application of those technologies. So one of the things that he talks about in here a lot is the threat to our jobs, right? So uh, is that going to threaten our jobs? What do we do uh, if our jobs are kind of taken away? And one of the things that he really thinks is going to happen is that we're going to see more inequality driven by AI, and this AI kind of drives to um, monopolies. So you have one uh company or one country that is going to be so far ahead that it's going to get difficult for anybody to to uh, compete with them. So, Don't we sort of have that already? It just Yeah, so the thing about maybe. Google with all of its data sets, you know, probably 6,000 data points on each one of us, uh, it uh, would be very hard to develop a system where we could go up against them, even if you had the same AI, uh, you don't have the data to train that, right? So these things will probably tend toward monopolies in the, in different uh, respective areas. So maybe I will have the most data um, on radiology, so I'll have the best you know data set there. And if I can make that proprietary so that only I have access to the data, then it's going to be more and more difficult for somebody to compete with me. But he kind of talks about in here about what are we going to do as jobs go away. He also talks about what jobs are probably more likely to go away. You know, you were saying that, yes, machines have taken over that low-end work. But you said that now they're going to go after that sector that is already so digitalized, like CPAs. So we've seen automation has been, uh, I don't know if we really call that AI, but we've seen that automation that in the 70s, 80s, and 90s has really transformed manufacturing. Manufacturing. So in the manufacturing, there's less and less people working in that field in the U.S., but there's, in fact, more manufacturing going on in the U.S. than ever before. Uh, it's just being done by automation. And uh, one of the problems with that is that it, there's less people involved. You need one or two programmers. Less paychecks going out to the individual Ex- workers. Exactly. Yeah. And so that has a social cost to us as well. But you're exactly right. It's going to be hard to automate, let's say, a healthcare worker, okay, or to a home healthcare worker, or someone else that uh, might be doing that type of job. Um, it's very hard for a robot to understand how to pick a strawberry. Uh, it's you know all these kind of things that uh, involve manual labor and and some you know calculation. Yeah, and also emotional intelligence, right? So being able to relate to uh, people you're taking care of or that. Uh, education, but uh, looking at some of these areas where um, there may be opportunities for optimization. So for an accountant, hopefully optimizes your finances generally to lower your tax burden or to um, optimize for your retirement or some other goal that you may have. Well, AI is really good at optimization. So that might be a perfect um, application for it is in kind of wealth management or uh, accounting 
uh, different areas there. Yeah, there's a company, I haven't used it, uh, it's called uh, Zero, but it's spelled with an X. <laughs> um, and I think they're out of New Zealand, and they actually are starting to use AI in their accounting uh, software. So uh, how can you um, optimize, uh, once again, where you are at the end of the year based on uh, patterns, and, and that's a great sort of thing for an AI to do. But um, he kind of talks in here about some of the different options that people have looked at for what do we do if, if jobs are not replaced at the same pace at which they're lost. So his idea is to have a social investment stipend, so a di little bit different than a universal basic income, which some people have talked about, but uh, basically paying people for care, service, and education that would encompass kind of a wide range of activities. So care for a young child, uh, attending to an aging parent, something like that, where you're uh, having the social benefit. You're not sitting around and playing video games, uh, but you are uh, having the social benefit in, in and society is is using the uh, great productivity that AI has given us and the great profits from it to uh, pay these folks. So that's, I mean, I think the reason he does that is there's a lot of people that have like a uh, just an aesthetic or a problem with the universal basic income. They don't like the idea of, of giving people money. But uh, it's interesting, Andrew Yang, who's a, a candidate in the Democratic uh, yes. field, one of, uh, well, it's narrowing now. I was going to say 40, but it's not quite that bad at this <laughs> yeah, point. Yeah, has um, right. actually got a book out. I haven't read it yet about um, his idea of a freedom dividend so that uh, we have uh, have had all these great growths in productivity uh, and we should have a, the American people should have a dividend for that. So, So that was kind of his idea. Anyway, very interesting discussions around that. But I think uh, if you look at this book, if you look at um, the Age of Surveillance Capitalism, there's another one called Zucked, if you're interested in the whole Facebook thing by Roger Magnum. There's another one called Zucked, if you're interested in the whole Facebook thing by Roger Magnum. Mm -hmm. He's one of the early investors and advisors to Facebook and is now really disturbed by where Facebook has ended up. Um, but all these. You are too, to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, I deliver. Deleted Facebook uh, in, back in January. I just think they're a horrible company. Uh, and he's uh, <clears throat> looking at, you know, how do you regulate these types of things? And, and I think there's been calls for regulation on lots of different sides, and including a lot of conservative voices uh, recently, people you wouldn't necessarily expect. All these are kind of pointing to this area of, are we going to have a tech-centered future or a human-centered future? Are we going to be slaves to technology? Are our lives going to be dictated by technology? Are we going to become a part of an, a, something to be optimized by an algorithm? Or are we going to uh, be able to understand how this technology can benefit us and work together to have a more uh, just and uh, more human society in which uh, we can all eke out at least a, a happy life for ourselves? Where do you think it's headed? I think the future is, our, is up for grabs. I think it's up to us to determine what the future is. But we'd have to determine it right away, and that means that the mass should be reading these books, <laughs> becoming a little bit more savvy. Yes. Well, I think uh, there is some of that happening. I mentioned last time this uh, good documentary um, called Hacked, Hacked. on uh, mm -hmm. Netflix. So I realize we don't all have time to read uh, thick books. Um, I have also have a little website I just put up with these books on it called learnabout.ai. Mm -hmm. So it's no .com, no .net, but just learnabout.ai. And I've also put some podcast episodes. So um, this Harvard professor, you know, this book is, it's like oh, it's only about 700 pages. Mm -hmm. But uh, the last 200 are notes. Um, the, <laughs> the, uh, but it's a really thick book. But she has some really good podcast episodes. They're just about an hour long. Uh, same with Kai Fu Lee. And uh, same with uh, Roger McNamee. So you can kind of get the gist of it. But I think things are um, starting to turn. Uh, people are starting to realize that uh, these companies are uh, structured in a way that almost seems anti-democratic. So Mark Zuckerberg, uh, while he's worth billions and his company is worth billions and is making billions of dollars, is publicly traded but is only controlled by him because they've split the shares up into these special types of shares where they have voting stock and then they have public stock. So even if, Dari, if you went out and uh, you emptied your bank account and bought 90% of <laughs> Facebook's st publicly available stock, you would still have no voice in how it's run. 
Uh, oh. Just this one man who's in his 30s mm. um, determines this billion people now. So um, whether Facebook's going to run experience experiments on us, whether they're going to allow micro-targeting by left-wing or right-wing political campaigns to um, manipulate us into the next election, um, all that's determined by one man, unelected, you know, and cannot be removed. So, uh, and once again, uh, it, it's a it's a network that has these uh, what we call in business moats. You know, it has these protective barriers where it would be very difficult. Um, so the two that looked like they were going to be competitors were Instagram and WhatsApp. They were immediately bought by Facebook. Snapchat appeared to be uh, another um, alternative. But what we see all the time is that anytime a Snapchat feature gets popular that gets converted into Instagram. So now Instagram is going to release this feature where you can share your location with intimate friends and and all this kind of stuff, which I guess is common in Snapchat. I'm not not on either one, but it's uh, this idea that following and making sure that no one else can compete with them. Now, some would argue against that. They'd say, well, you know, Microsoft was so dominant and now it's now it's not. Uh, but we'll we'll see what happens with this. I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of smart people at Facebook that don't want to uh, see their dominance wane. Of course. Yeah. What an interesting time to be in the business school. Yes, yes, it is. Now, um, one of the other things that's um, kind of an uh, interesting... We'll just take a little bit of a break here in order to let you know of a few things that are going to be happening here in the community. Uh, Please know that on Friday evening, November 8th, 2019, that's this year, I'm not sure what I was thinking of, but at 6 p.m., the Central Missouri Returned Peace Corps volunteer and the um, University of Missouri's Africa Hub present a free screen of, of Makala. The film is in the Leadership Auditorium in the Students Center on the University of Missouri campus. Makala will be screened as part of the Third Goal International Film Series. The doors open at 6 p.m., but before the film, Congolese native and uh, University of Missouri Rural Sociology graduate Gloria Manconi speaks about challenges in modern Congo. There will also be Congolese food, music, dance, and trivia with prizes before the screening. You can get more information at 573-884-2003, or you can go to Peace Corps at Missouri. Dot edu. And I want to let you know also that on Tuesday, <clears throat> November 5th, um, that Tuesday before the Friday of the screening of the film, uh, on Evening Edition, we'll be interviewing Trevor Harris, um, who um, is one of the, the, the returning Peace Corps veterans. And uh, so he'll be talking about this um, um, annual Third Goal International Film Series. It'll be an interesting discussion with Trevor Harris. Harris. Um, also, please know that... <clears throat> Dan Veets coming up at the 7 o'clock hour. Dan Veets and his guests discuss sex, drugs, and civil liberties um, every Tuesday evenings on KOPN. Dan's guest tonight will be Jeanette Mott. Oxford, the executive director of Empower Missouri. Janet is a former member of the Missouri General Assembly. The organization she leads will be holding its state conference in Columbia on Saturday, November 9th at Hickman High School. Dan and Jeanette will be discussing the problem of mass incarceration, which will also be a topic at the Empower Missouri State Conference on November 9th. Please join Dan Veets and his guest, Jeanette Mott Oxford, tonight at 7 p.m. on KOPN 89.5 FM and live streamed around the globe at KOPN.org. Okay, let's get back to the interview with Professor Christensen. Okay, thank you so much for listening to KOPN. Thank you.
And I did bring a textbook here. It's called Persuasive Technology, Using Computers to Change What We Think and Do. Uh, this is a Stanford professor, B.J. Fogg, F-O-G-G. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's spelled differently than the fog we had this morning. <laughs> but... Um, uh, he wrote this book, and it basically combines uh, kind of psychology along with uh, technology. Uh, and it's not saying... Looks like a textbook. Almost. It is a textbook. It's oh, a textbook okay. used in a Stanford class. And he's talking about how computers can be used to persuade people. Uh, now, this might be good, right? So if you uh, are saying, well, uh, we want to persuade uh, Scott to get out and take a walk uh, at least once a week, uh, that might be a good thing to do. And so we see this built into you know, Fitbit, other types of uh, technologies that we may say are generally nudging us in the right direction. But this technology can is kind of agnostic as to how it gets used right and so it can be good be used for good or for evil and uh, so this is kind of the um, uh, a lot of the folks that work in technology that found some of these uh, found some of these companies have used this kind of textbook uh, as their basis to figure out how to make their app addictive okay so we have this idea of like infinite scrolling where it just goes on and on and on forever um, other th uh, things that uh, like random rewards almost like slot machines where we whether you get that like or you get that little, um, uh, basically a little feedback that hits your uh, hits your brain and you get a little hit of dopamine, <laughs> yeah. right? So um, that um, that's kind of where you a lot of this started. You were explaining us. that in the field of politics. You were talking about that use of verbiage of words right the prediction was that of bias etc yeah so there's a there's probably well over a hundred biases that we have and um what's interesting about our biases is that um we often don't believe them right so uh confirmation bias is one a common one and that was the one we were referring to there that if i tell you um something or you want to believe something uh, anytime you see some data that will support that uh, you will take that in and in fact you will discount anything that um would uh be contrary to that so that's called the confirmation bias and so uh you know, we see uh, if we want to believe that Republicans are, are horrible people, uh, then whenever we see a Republican that does something we perceive as bad, that confirms that. Whenever we see a Republican doing something that's good, then we would say, oh, well, that's just an exception. Okay, so there's these biases that we all have, and it's very hard to recognize them and when they're being used kind of against us, right? And it's, so that becomes very difficult to tell. It's just a psychological fact. It's where um, it's not only just the uh, feedback computer world, but it's the messaging. So when you start to look into things where we're trying to convince people that global warming is not an issue, uh, then how do we form a message so that um, it will inoculate them from information that would be contrary to that message? Uh, so that's really more kind of the political operative type of um, uh, mode to that, if you will. But, yeah, so there's just a whole complex range of issues here that we, uh, you know, could uh, dive into. And it is kind of intimidating. But I think one of the things that's disturbing to a lot of parents nowadays is how addictive this technology is. And there's a new book. I haven't read it yet called Glow Kids, but I've heard it's really good. And it's by a gentleman who studies addiction. And he's just looking at these technologies and how our kids are becoming addicted to this and how companies are building addictive features in to our social media. I mean, if we go to, if we, you and I go to Las Vegas and we go to a casino, we're probably expecting that it's been designed to take our money or to take our time to yeah. keep us in the casino. Okay, we we know that the psychologists have um, that data has honed been used. That, yeah. yeah, it's it honed it to a random reward and and all this kind of stuff that we learned about in our psychology classes. But now we're seeing that technology let loose on our children. And so that's, uh, you know, fairly disturbing, especially when uh, we know that the human brain doesn't really stop developing until what, 23, 25, somewhere in that range. So we're now letting loose this uh, technology on um, children whose brains aren't fully de developed yet. You're working with students who are in 2021. 
How are your students receiving a lot of this information? Yeah. Um, we think that they know a lot. Right. It's interesting, too. Uh, I find in my classes that uh, you and I may think that, well, the students understand a lot about technology. Well, they understand how to consume technology. They're not as good at how do you produce it, how do you, um, what is going on behind the scenes. I think that one of the things that's very common is uh, that students are surprised by how much time they're spending. Okay, because once again, we kind of discount, right? I'm not addicted. Uh, that I want that belief to be a true. I don't use social media that much. Uh, I want that to be true, so I discount any data about how long I spent. So one of the things I do in my classes, I'll often uh, get some volunteers to let me uh, have their phones for a bit and have them unlock it, have them guess how long they were on social media, and then we look at the screen time and see actually how long they were on social media. It's usually about, uh, they usually guess about half the amount of time. So they'll say, well, I was only on for like six hours last week, and it'll be 12, or they'll say 10, and it'll be 20. Um, and I'm sure that as adults we do that too but I think having that uh, screen time data having that data where you can actually see that oh um, this is not true um, I'm spending way too much time right yeah. Yeah. So that ability to concentrate, that ability to do deep work can you turn everything off and concentrate on it for you know two three hours at a time um, that's uh, can you read a book for that amount of time? So without checking your Snapchats, checking your Facebook, uh, having the ding go off for your email. My, you, uh, our generation is maybe addicted to email, right? So you always have that email open. Can you just turn it off and not respond? Okay. Um, can you uh, turn off your notifications so you can actually get some deep work done? And some people are really predicting that that's going to be uh, one of the things. say 10 and it'll be 20 um, and I'm sure that as adults we do that too but I think having that uh, screen time data having that data where you can actually see that oh um, this is not true um, I'm spending way too much time right yeah. Yeah. so that ability to concentrate that ability to do deep work can you turn everything off and concentrate on it for you know two three hours at a time um, that's uh, can you read a book for that amount of time? So without checking your Snapchats, checking your Facebook, uh, having the ding go off for your email. My, you, uh, our generation is maybe addicted to email, right? So you always have that email open. Can you just turn it off and not respond? Okay. Um, can you uh, turn off your notifications so you can actually get some deep work done? And some people are really predicting that that's going to be uh, one of the things that separates people that are successful from uh, unsuccessful people uh, as far as after college is whether they those can... Those who are constantly yeah, distracted. And yeah, whether they can uh, uh, survive at work and do some deep work or whether they are um, going to be uh, unable to do that and so they'll always be doing lesser jobs. They won't rise to the you know leadership positions in their companies. Yeah. I think we've seen that, haven't we, in workplaces where you're seeing that people are distracted, that the private yeah. phones... In a workplace? Yes, and um, some companies have started to ban them um, because uh, I know a friend of mine that he is in a service industry where they would be working on air conditioners and things uh, of that nature in a person's house, and all his workers would, uh, he found out that 
what used to take two hours is now taking six because so-and-so had to talk to his girlfriend, so-and-so got a text and showed it around to everybody else, and uh, it's now basically banned cell phones uh, so that you, uh, unless there's an absolute emergency, you call, if there's an emergency, you have someone call the office, and that'll get relayed to you. Um, but otherwise, uh, uh, basically not allowing this on the workplace because it was just uh, hugely unproductive. But I think in office work, it kind of seeps and creeps in, right? So maybe you check check Facebook or check uh, your eBay uh, auction or something during lunch hour. Well, now <laughs> you now you do it a little bit, yeah. uh, you know, uh, just a little bit this hour and that that hour, and now it's constantly open for uh, <laughs> various reasons. A lot of people have two screens, right? And so you keep one screen with all that uh, junk on it, and then you try and do your work on the other screen. <laughs> are you are you guilty of that? Am I? <laughs> yes. No, no. No, I'm, okay. <laughs> I don't think I am. But who knows? You know, mm. I may be just like the students and say, oh, well, I was... <laughs> right, right. Do you, Scott, as uh, somebody who's getting into the, the depths of technology, do you turn off all of your social media and then work? The two things I would say that I use as far as social media would be Twitter and Reddit. Mainly on Reddit, I look at the... Uh, awe which is like cute puppies and stuff like that <laughs> and um uh they won't arrest you for that right right hopefully not the um i have that only on my ipad so mm -hmm. i only have that at home i don't generally take my ipad around with me uh so i have that at home i may uh, check twitter in the morning i also check new york times on my ipad and stuff like that and then i will uh in the evening sometimes i look at reddit you know kind of calm down look at all the cute puppy pictures uh, at the end of the day and sometimes i do that maybe more than i should uh, but uh, once again it's only at home i try to quit my email uh, when I'm, I might check it once or twice a day. So I try to do just one time where I'm processing email, usually in the late afternoon, because by then my concentration is uh, not as clear. It's usually for me the mornings are the best to do some serious writing or something like that and or some serious work on classes. Grading is you know mentally challenging as well. And um, do those things early and then leave email for the end of the day. And, in fact, on my email signature at the bottom it says I'm not checking email every day. Uh, if it's urgent, call my cell phone, and I give you my cell phone number. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of interesting, that kind of cultural shift, because a lot of people will use email almost like it's instant messaging or text messaging. So I sent you an With email. The expectation at, that you're going to right. immediately be available. Right. So they will expect you to have responded to something that they sent just an hour ago. You know, I sent that email an hour ago. I haven't heard back. And so you are also, if you do respond right away, then you're setting an expectation. Okay, so sometimes when I see something that comes in, I won't respond right away because I don't want to set an expectation that I am there and can be uh, available all the time uh, for things that are more trivial. Um, not to say that email shouldn't be processed or looked at, I, but I, you batch it. You batch it into uh, an hour-long session uh, and... Um, you can you can get things done a lot more efficiently that way. And it's interesting, too, because uh, some of my students ask me, well, my God, what are you going to do if, you know, the, the dean or somebody else, you know, emails you and, and uh, you know, uh, and you're not responding right away? And I'm like, you know, he never emails me and say, hey, there's extra cake in the office. <laughs> you know, it's always like, you know, here's some report we need or something else. Well, that can wait, okay? Um, it's not uh, uh, that urgent, right? I'm not going to miss out on cake. If I was going to miss out on cake, then maybe I would change my email policy. But, um yeah, so it's an interesting kind of sh cultural shift. But people kind of understand that, though. If you t explain to them, I'm trying to get some serious work done, uh, they will understand, oh, well, uh, that makes sense because I know I have a hard time doing that as well. I'm not always perfect in that regard, um, but I think I'm getting better. It's, it's something you have to practice at, right? Recently I did a interview with Dar Shamal, who's a climate change journalist, very serious, in-depth scientific reporting. And he suggests that it is necessary to get away and just go out in the woods and look at the trees. Or, and it sounds necessary in order to, to remain 
human enough. I mean, he's looking at it as an idea that you're concerned with the earth and realizing that you're part of this larger connected world. I would, yeah, I would uh, agree with that. I mean, I think uh, back on the things I remember most, and they were often in nature or seeing something in nature that was uh, spectacular. Um, I think it has, uh, well, well, we do have this kind of weird dichotomy in in business where we have um, this uh, big emphasis on productivity. Okay, here's an app that's going to make you more productive. Uh, Here's how you use uh, this app to do this thing, and it's going to make you more productive. And then we have all this uh, mindfulness. You need to be mindful. need to do meditation on an app in the morning, (laughs) right? And uh, so there's this kind of weird dichotomy where uh, we're going to make things uh, more intense and then we're going to intensely uh, disconnect. So um, so true, Scott. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of a weird thing that's going on, especially in the workplace especially with uh, young companies' culture sometimes. Right, and maybe what you need to do is just, you know, go home at 5 and take a nice long walk with your doggy. You know, I think there's a, a lot to be said about that. And when you talk about climate change, too, you know, this is a complex issue. Um, it's very complex. Cultural uh, aspects, political pl- aspects, you know, intertwines with technology uh, in lots of different ways. But we're expected to see people debate this in, you know, maybe one or 30 second sound bites. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Think about the Lincoln Douglas debates. What were they like? Two day long debates, right? And they would, and one side would talk for about two hours, have a little break. The other side would talk for two hours and have lunch. Then you'd do the same thing in the afternoon and then the same thing the next day. It's because slavery at the time was a very complex issue, right? It involved a lot of you know, elements of politics, culture, economics, same sort of thing we're dealing with climate change. Well, do we have the bandwidth to be able to uh, engage in such debates, you know, because it's not, you know, not all aspects of this are perfectly clear. We may agree on the science, but okay, well, how do we restructure economies to deal with this? Is it a carbon tax? Is it, you know, uh, some other method? Uh, how do we go about approaching this crisis? And uh, I think a lot of people are disturbed about our ability to not only speak, but to listen. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Are you listening out there, you audience <laughs> at KOPN? We're speaking with Scott Christensen, professor at the University of Missouri in the School of Business. He's talking to us about artificial intelligence and going into depth here. How will the public best enter into the field? We're all giving our information w- without much restraint, uh, but we're also somewhat alarmed by certain things like facial recognition all of a sudden we can see them circumstances where we're not really in charge of our lives anymore well uh you could uh, uh take a week off of social media okay take take two weeks off of social media um see what happens does your life go away do you not have friends anymore Or do you uh, maybe take some time? Maybe more appealing. (laughs) Right. Maybe instead of the hours that you're going to spend each day on Facebook, find one or two friends to have coffee with or have a long conversation on the telephone. That's one thing that's great about, uh, you know, telephone nowadays. It doesn't cost that much to uh, have a long distance call with somebody in Washington, D.C. or within uh, uh, even overseas and uh, make those connections. See if you enjoy that more than scrolling through something. Uh, And then you can decide later if you want to quit it altogether, if you want to put some sort of restrictions on yourself. But I think these are things that kind of seep and creep into our lives. So you kind of start, you know, oh, I'll check Facebook once once a week. And, oh, look, there's this neat stuff for my high school friends. Okay, well, now it's gotten more and more and more. And sometimes until we stop, we don't really realize how addictive it's become. Okay. Uh, and I think, um, you know, it's not to say it's like some moral failing. We're all, you know, built like this. We're all uh, uh, built to engage in these products. And these projects, products are made to engage us. So I would suggest that's one place to start is to simply um, do something for yourself and, and take a little break from these things or find some ways to uh, change your behavior or uh, structure your behavior around uh, these addictive technologies. Uh, certainly calling into question, um, uh, 
you know, our, our politicians, our local representatives, uh, even our city council members, you know, ask them, okay, well, how is the data being used on these cameras? Uh, how, uh, what authority do I have to access my data? What authority do I have to delete my data? And maybe even asking those people, uh, that you do business with, okay? You walk into a bank, there's uh, cameras there for security reasons. There's good reasons for that. Is that data retained? Is that data used to build a model of my behavior? Um, same thing in the mall. Great for security, you know, catching that shoplifter or whatever. But is that data that I was in the mall five years ago still retained to build a profile of what Scott wants? Do I have access to delete that data? Do, you know, who's going to decide these things? And I think that's one of the inqu uh, interesting questions that's brought up in that book I mentioned, The uh, Age of Surveillance uh, Capitalism, was about um, who decides. You know, who gets to decide uh, who gets access this data and how it gets used. Is our data really ours or is it someone else's data? As soon as you voice it or script it, right. it belongs to who knows. Right. Yeah. Um, do you use these books in your courses? Um, we're going to do a session on one of my courses in the graduate course where we're going to look at, uh, well, we're going to do two sessions. One, we're going to look specifically at social media, but we'll also look at um, uh, some of the big four companies that are really the uh, monopolies in their areas. So Google. Facebook, Apple, uh, Google, and Amazon. There's a book by Scott Galloway called The Four, uh, which talks about how each one of these uh, appeals to a basic human instinct. So Google is like God. It ap appeals to your brain. You know, is my child going to be okay? Do I have cancer? All these things that you would Google that you wouldn't talk to your priest about. Right. And uh, so then uh, Facebook, that connection to the heart, you want to be liked by people. You want other people to like you. Um, so that's a, a basic connection and a basic uh, human need we have. And Amazon is this consumption. So the gut. So we need to um, consume. And back when we were, uh, you know, eking out our uh, survival either in northern Europe or in Africa or wherever, if you over consumed, um, well, that didn't really hurt you. You might make it through the winter, right? Whereas if you underconsumed, you might not make it through the winter. Heart disease 20 years from now is not really a concern to somebody who's trying to get through the winter, right? So overconsumption, we're biased toward overconsumption to more things. We want to gather things. Uh, and so Amazon appeals to that. And then um, uh, he says that Apple appeals to our sexual drive, so that it's really a luxury brand. So I look cool if I have an Apple product. Um, I'm going to uh, yes, it it's, it te tells potential mates that I will uh, be able to care for their offspring uh, if they um, uh, were to select me as their mate. Uh, so he goes in this whole kind of uh, rant about that, and uh, Apple does in fact make margins on par with a luxury brand. So they are not the same as a technology company. So you really want to think about Apple as being not a tech company, but a luxury brand. And um, so that's uh, one book that we kind of start into this. Uh, why are these so dominant? Uh, why have they grown so fast? What is their business model? You know that idea with uh, not making money. So Amazon for many years did not make any money in order to grow fast. Uh, of course, that had some consequences, right, for, for small businesses. We're above what used to be, I think, uh, the pen point was down uh, on Broadway for years and years. And Holly Burgess ran that um, nice little stationary place. And um, that eventually went out of business. But there's lots of other brick-and-mortar consequences, right, for small businesses for having some place like Amazon. Yeah. Oh, you can see it. Yeah. yeah. So, and then, and then we're also going to talk about social media. And there's been some interesting cases going on. Uh, actually, the law school dean just wrote a, a interesting paper about is uh, you know social media so, uh, public space. So our local representative, Sherry Reich, um, had blocked a bunch of people on Twitter. That went up through the courts, and the courts, in fact, said she did not have the right to block people on Twitter, uh, that she was a public official, and it was uh, their uh, uh, citizen's right to be able to criticize our public official. It's kind of one of the fundamental um, rights that we believe in here in the U.S., so that's going to be interesting how that plays out because she's also deleted her Twitter account. Now, does, do, do public officials are required to have accounts on certain 
social media. Social media. Um, there's also numerous other cases that are making their way through the courts. So um, that's really fascinating. Yeah, so it's it? fascinating yeah. stuff. Um, where does it stop being uh, a public company? When does it become almost like a public utility? Um, you know, I think the law and public opinion are going to have lots of different answers to that question, and that will be an interesting thing to follow in the next year or two as to how this plays out. Yeah. Well, listen, uh, Scott Christensen, our time is about up. Is there any other advice that we'd like to leave the listening audience with other than perhaps turning off the... Uh, yeah, um, I would say that would be your... a great experiment to try. Try it with your family. Uh, you know, have a, a week uh, where you're going to just go right. off technology. For, a couple of days. Yeah, right? a couple of days, a weekend. See what that's like. See, um, And at the end of it, do a little reflection with your family. As far as, uh, you know, what did we gain from being more engaged with each other? Maybe for some families it's better to be on social media. I don't know. Uh, Brilliant talk again by Scott Christensen. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Daria.